Good evening. My name is Lynn Thompson. I'm a proud alumna of Scripps College and chair-elect of the Board of Trustees. <laughs> Thank you for that. I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's event with Arundhati Roy in conversation with Hector Tobar, which is presented in partnership with the Library Foundation of Los Angeles and the Japanese American Cultural and Community Center. Our mission at Scripps College is to educate women to develop their intellects and talents through active participation in a community of scholars, so that as graduates, they may contribute to society through public and private lives of leadership, service, integrity, and creativity. We fulfill this mission by providing our students a transformative educational experience that is rooted in the humanities, informed by contemporary social, economic, and political challenges, and fueled by dialogue. All year long, the college, under the auspices of Scripps Presents, hosts writers, artists, performers and scholars at our campus in Claremont as a way to provide a forum for community engagement and the exchange of ideas beyond the classroom and nurture an environment for inquiry and intellectual exchange. Tonight is quite special for the college as it's the first time we're presenting an event in downtown Los Angeles. For us, it's a rare and exciting opportunity to share our mission with a wider audience that includes not only our students and our alumni, but all of Los Angeles as well. We're honored to be in the room with all of you and hope we'll get a chance to host you on our campus in Claremont or again downtown. Until then, I'm very pleased to present Louise Steinman, Director of Cultural Programs of the Allowed series, who will introduce our distinguished guests. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Welcome, Los Angeles. Hello. First, Thank you uh, to Scripps Present, and also I want to, uh, to Lynn, a special t uh, shout out to the curator of that program, Karina Lesser. I'm so glad we could partner together tonight on tonight's program, so thank you so much. And thank you to our partners at the JACCC. Um, as I noted, Monday night, when we were here on Monday night for an evening with Roxane Gay in the same theater, this is Fierce Women Week at the Aratani with the Loud, so. I welcome you to it. Um, for those of you who are new to Allowed, I know many of you come over there to the Central Library, but if you're new to it, we present programs year-round, most of them at the beautiful Central Library, just a few blocks away from here and at other venues around the city. And we hope that you'll join us through the month of July to the end of our season uh, for some free events at Central Library and here again at the Eritani on July 18th for an evening with Sherman Alexi. Remember, if you're a Library Foundation member, you get advance notice of our upcoming events and discounts on tickets, but most of all, by joining the Library Foundation, you are supporting the Los Angeles Public Library, an institution we can and must all cherish and keep healthy, especially in these times. So <laughs> consider becoming a member. A little housekeeping before I um, begin my introduction of Arundhati. We have two microphones for the Q&A um, after the conversation and the reading. They'll be down here. We'll try to get to as many of you as we can. We probably won't get to all of you. If you can ask a question for a question, that would be much appreciated. Um, afterwards, Arundhati will be signing her books in the lobby. And if you didn't get a chance to pick up your book tonight, um, we'll have them available, available in the lobby for, for pickup. Now, on to the program. It's been 17 years since Arundhati Roy published her debut Booker Prize winning novel, The God of Small Things. And in the intervening years, however, she's not been idle. Indeed, she's become well known as a prolific essayist and polemicist in her native India, and as well an activist. She's written eight books, including most recently Things That Can and Cannot Be Said, co authored with John Cusack, and other works include The End of Imagination, which condemns India and Pakistan's nuclear showdown, The Doctor and the Saint, an examination of caste, 
capitalism a ghost story about the reforms in India that have further dispossessed the country's poor. She's written about mass suicides of farmers whose land has been destroyed by mineral exploitation. She wrote about the 2002 Gujarat massacre of Muslims by Hindus. She wrote about the struggle for freedom in Kashmir, about paramilitary operations in central India against indigenous tribal populations. And she was jailed during a campaign against a new mega dam. She is not easily intimidated. She was born in Northeast India to a Syrian Christian mother and a Hindu father who managed a tea plantation in a small town. Her parents separated when she was two and Roy's mother took her two children and returned to her hometown in Kerala. Arundhati spent some of her youth living among the poor and from them, she noted to one interviewer, she learned to see the world from the point of view of absolute vulnerability. And it's a point of view that has not left her. Her new novel is about India and the stories within stories of this novel unfurls India's national griefs. She writes that quote, with partition in 1947, God's carrot had burst open on the new border between India and Pakistan and a million people died of hatred. As the New Yorker noted, the consequences of that terrible event form the main story of the Ministry of Utmost Happiness. Tonight, Arundhati Roy will discuss her remarkable new book with Hector Tobar, a longtime friend of the Library Foundation, who is the son of Guatemalan immigrants, and for many decades, Hector reported both as a domestic and foreign correspondent for the Los Angeles Times. As he says, the hometown paper his father used to deliver. He's the author of four prize-winning books. His latest is a New York Times bestseller, Deep Down Dark, The Untold Stories of 33 Men Buried in a Chilean Mine and the Miracle that Set Them Free. He's currently a professor of English and literary jur journalism at UC Irvine. You know, over the years at Aloud, we've presented many artists, activists, and I like to think of them sort of at this um, dinner party, um, talking to each other over time and distance. And that grand party would include the likes of Eve Ensler and Susan Sontag, Margaret Atwood, Liberia's Leigh McBowie, Russia's Masha Gessen, South Africa's Albi Sachs, Uruguay's Eduardo Galeano, and Mexico's poet activist Javier Cecilia. And I'd always hoped that we could present the late, great John Berger at Aloud, and sadly, it's too late for that, but tonight we are so thrilled to present his dear friend, Arundhati Roy, who like John Berger is a true witness to the human condition. Please join me in welcoming Arundhati Roy and Hector Tobar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. I'm truly honored to get such a wonderful reception. I was just sitting backstage and wondering what I had done, sitting so far away and writing what I write to deserve such a lovely audience. Um, I'm going to just read for about 15 minutes. It's a difficult book to read from because everything is so interconnected, but uh, maybe we'll unravel those connections when we speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, after the questions, I'll end with a very brief reading. So, just to mess with your heads, I'm going to read from towards the end of the book and then end with the beginning of the book. <laughs> um, so this is, this is uh, chapter nine, and it's called The Untimely Death of Miss Jabin the First. And at the head of it is a quote by James Baldwin, which says, and they would not believe me precisely because they would know that what I said was true. Ever since she was old enough to insist, she had insisted on being called Miss Jibin. It was the only name she would answer to. Everyone had to call her that, her parents, her grandparents, the neighbors too. She was a precocious devotee of the Miss Fetish, 
that gripped the Kashmir Valley in the early years of the insurrection. All of a sudden, fashionable young ladies, especially in the towns, insisted on being addressed as Miss, Miss Momin, Miss Ghazala, Miss Farhana. It was only one of the many fetishes of the times. In those blood-dimmed years, for reasons nobody fully understood, people became what can only be described as fetish-prone. Other than the Miss fetish, there was a nurse fetish, a PT instructor fetish, and a roller skating fetish. So in addition to check posts, bunkers, weapons, grenades, landmines, casapirs, concertina wire, soldiers, insurgents, counterinsurgents, spies, special operatives, double agents, triple agents, and suitcases of cash from the agencies on both sides of the border. The valley was also awash with nurses, PT instructors, and roller skaters. And, of course, misses. Among them, Miss Jabin, who didn't live long enough to become a nurse, nor even a roller skater. In the mazar e shahoda the martyr's graveyard where she was first buried, the cast-iron signboard that arched over the main gate said, in two languages, we gave our todays for your tomorrows. It's corroded now, the green paint faded, the delicate calligraphy flecked with pinholes of light. Still, there it is after all these years, silhouetted like a swatch of stiff lace against the sapphire sky and the snowy, saw-toothed mountains. There it still is. All those who watched Musa Yesvi bury his wife and daughter noticed how quiet he had been that day. He displayed no grief. He seemed withdrawn and distracted, as though he wasn't really there. That could have been what eventually led to his arrest or it could, could have been his heartbeat. Perhaps it was too quick or too slow for an innocent civilian. At notorious check posts, soldiers sometimes put their ears to young men's chests and listened to their heartbeats. There were rumors that some soldiers even carried stethoscopes. This one's heart's beating for freedom, they'd say, and that would be reason enough for the body that hosted the too quick or too slow heart to make a trip to Cargo or Papa Tu or the Shiraz Cinema, the most dreaded interrogation centers in the valley. Musa was not arrested at a check post. He was picked up from his home after the funeral. Over quietness at the funeral mm. of your wife and child would not have passed unnoticed in those days. At first, of course, everybody had been quiet, fearful, the funeral procession snaked its way through the drab, slushy little city in dead silence. The only sound was the slap, slap, slap of thousands of sockless shoes on the silver-wet road that led to the mazar e shahoda Young men carried 17 coffins on their shoulders. So 17 tin coffins wove through the streets, winking back at the winter sun. To someone looking down at the city from the ring of high mountains that surrounded it, the procession would have looked like a column of brown ants carrying 17 sugar crystals to their anthill to feed their queen. Perhaps to a student of human history and of history and human com conflict, in relative terms, that's all the little procession really amounted to a column of ants making off with some crumbs that had fallen from the high table. As wars go, this was only a small one. Nobody paid much attention, so it went on and on. So it folded and unfolded over decades, gathering people into its unhinged embrace. Its cruelties became as natural as the changing seasons, each came with its own unique range of scent and blossom, its own cycle of loss and renewal, disruption and normalcy, uprisings and elections. Of all the sugar crystals carried by the ants that winter morning, the smallest crystal, of course, went by the name of Miss Jubin. Ants that were too nervous to join the procession 
lined the streets standing on slippery banks <coughs> of old brown snow, their arms crossed inside the warmth of their herons, leaving their empty sleeves to flap in the breeze, armless people at the heart of an armed insurrection. Those who were too scared to venture out watched from their windows and balconies. Each of them knew that they were being tracked in the gun sights of the soldiers who had taken position across the city, on roofs, bridges, boats, mosques, water towers. They had occupied hotels, schools, shops, and even some homes. It was cold that morning. For the first time in years, the lake had frozen over and the forecast predicted more snow. Trees raised their naked, mottled branches to the sky like mourners stilled in attitudes of grief. In the graveyard, 17 graves had been readied, neat, fresh, deep. The earth from each pit piled up next to it, a dark chocolate pyramid. An advance party had brought the blood-stained metal stretchers on which the bodies had been returned to their families after the post-mortem. They were propped up, arranged around the trunks of trees like bloodied steel petals of some gigantic flesh-eating mountain blossom. As the procession turned in through the gates of the graveyard, a scrum of pressmen quivering like athletes on their starting blocks broke rank and rushed forward. The coffins were laid down, opened, arranged in a line on the icy earth. The crowd made room for the press respectfully. It knew that without the journalists and photographers, the massacre would be erased and the dead would truly die. So the bodies were offered to them in hope and anger, a banquet of death. Mourning relatives who had backed away were asked to return into frame. Their sorrow was to be archived. In the years to come, when the war became a way of life, there would be books and films and photo exhibitions curated around the theme of Kashmir's grief and loss. Mm. Musa would not be in any of those pictures. On this occasion, Miss Jabin was by far the biggest draw. The cameras closed in on her, whirring and clicking like a worried bear. From that harvest of photographs, one emerged a local classic. For years, it was reproduced in papers and magazines on the covers of human rights reports that no one ever read, with captions like, blood in the snow, veil of tears, and will the sorrow never end. When the worried bear dispersed and revealed Miss Jabin intact, it revealed Miss Jabin intact, unmauled, fast asleep. As the bodies were lowered into the graves, the crowd began to murmur its prayer. Rabish Rahli Sadri Wayasirli Amri Wahlul Ukdatan Min Lisani Yafkabu Kauli. My Lord, relieve my mind and ease my task for me, and loose a knot from my tongue that they may understand my saying. The smaller hip high children in the separate segregated section for women, suffocated by the rough wool of their mother's garments, unable to see very much barely able to breathe, conducted their own hip-level transactions. I'll give you six bullet casings if you give me your dud grenade. A lone woman's voice climbed into the sky, eerily high, raw pain driven through it like a pike. Ro rahi hai ye zameen, ro raha hai asman. Another joined in and then another. This earth, she weeps, the heavens too. The birds stopped their twittering for a while and listened, beady-eyed, to human song. Street dogs slouched past checkposts unchecked, their heartbeats rock steady. Kites and griffins circled the thermals, drifting lazily back and forth across the line of control, just to mock the tiny clot of humans gathered down below. When the sky was full of keening, something ignited. Young men began to leap into the air like flames kindled from smoldering embers. Higher and higher they jumped, as though the ground beneath their feet was sprung, a trampoline. They wore their anguish like armor, 
their anger slung across their bodies like ammunition belts. At that moment, perhaps because they were thus armed, or because they had decided to embrace a life of death, or because they knew that they were already dead, they became invincible. The soldiers who surrounded the Mazar e Shahda had clear instructions to hold their fire no matter what. Their informers, brothers, cousins, fathers, uncles, nephews, who mingled with the crowd and shouted slogans as passionately as everybody else, and even meant them, had clear instructions to submit photographs and, if possible, videos of each young man who carried on the tide of fury had leapt into the air and turned himself into a flame. Soon each of them would hear a knock on his door or be taken aside at a checkpoint. Are you so-and-so, son of so-and-so, employed at such and such? Often the threat went no further than that, just that bland, perfunctory inquiry. In Kashmir, throwing a man's own biodata at him was sometimes enough to change the course of his life, and sometimes it wasn't. They came for Musa at their customary visiting hour, four in the morning. He was awake, sitting at his desk, writing a letter. His mother was in the next room. He could hear her crying and the comforting murmurs of his sisters and relatives. Musa heard the ve vehicle approach from his first floor window. He saw it turn into the lane and stop outside his house. He felt nothing, neither anger nor trepidation, as he watched the soldiers get out of the armored gypsy. His father, Shaukat Yeswi, Godzilla to Musa and his friends, was awake too, sitting cross-legged on the carpet in the front room. He was a building contractor who worked closely with the military engineering services, supplying building materials and doing turnkey projects for them. He had sent his son to Delhi to study architecture in the hope that he would help him expand his line of business. But when the uprising began in 1990 and Godzilla continued to work with the army, Musa shunned him altogether. Torn between filial duty and the guilt of enjoying what he saw as the spoils of collaboration, Musa found it harder and harder to live under the same roof as his father. Shaukat Yeswi seemed to have been expecting the soldiers. He did not appear alarmed. Amrik Singh called. He wants to talk to you. It's nothing. Don't worry. He will re release you before daylight. Musa did not reply. He, don't, he did not even glance at Godzilla, his disgust apparent in the way he held his shoulders and in the erectness of his back. He walked out of the front door, escorted by two armed men on either side of him, and got into the vehicle. He was not handcuffed or headbagged. The gypsy slid through the slick, frozen streets. It had begun to snow again. Thank you. Thank you, Arundhati, for joining us. Thank you for that beautiful reading. Welcome to Thank California, you, to Hector, Los Angeles. Thank you for talking to me. <laughs> yes. We're, I think, a city that's maybe almost as diverse as Delhi is, judging from your book. Um, so this, you read a passage uh, that begins with a baby. There are two babies who are the main sort of plot points uh, in this novel. One who is born, Ms. Jablin, into the situation of violence in Kashmir one who's born into a mixed identity, a sort of war of identities that goes on in Delhi. But um, books themselves are kind of like babies, no? The gestation's a little bit longer. You had written many works of nonfiction after your last novel. Do you remember the moment of conception of this novel or the season of conception when this novel began? Oh. Well, you know, in a way, there was a sort of, um, I think, I, think I, I do remember the first thing I wrote, but that was not perhaps, uh, firstly, it wasn't the beginning of the book, but also 
I think, uh, you know, I, I, over the last 20 years, all the other living and writing and traveling that I'd been doing, it, it sort of had been settling in me in layers. And I, I felt like I was a, some kind of a sed sedimentary rock, you know? Mm. And I knew that fiction, um, fiction isn't, for me, something utilitarian. It doesn't mm -hmm. have any direct goal, while the rest of my nonfiction is an argument, is an urgent intervention. Fiction is an offering. Fiction is a universe, mm -hmm. or a prayer, or a song, or an invitation to walk through a universe. Mm -hmm. So um, it wasn't, you know, for me enough to, to know things. It had to visit me, and the characters actually all began to visit me. Uh, first infrequently, then very frequently, then they wouldn't go away, and then they just moved in, you know? <laughs> but, uh, but the, first, the first thing that I did write uh, is set in a place called Jantar Mantar in Delhi, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's the sort of nerve center of the book, and it's a place where all the resistance movements and dreamers and idlers and nut jobs and people on hunger strike for a better world for, you know, 18 years, and pamphleteers, and me, <laughs> used to hang mm -hmm. around a lot. And one night when I was there, many years ago, uh, you know, often, for instance, if, if I was asked to go and speak in a university, often late at night in, in the students' mess, you know, we would go, people, I would go and speak, and so, sometimes I'd say to the students, why don't you come? here to Jantar Mantar, and you can speak to people who really know uh, mm -hmm. what's going on. And one of those nights, uh, suddenly this baby appeared, an abandoned baby, oh really. Um, and of course, it's not, uh, I mean, the way it happened in the book is not the way it happened when I was there, but it really set me thinking, because you had all these wisdom of all these resistance movements and all these people together, and they were just confounded by what to do with the baby, hmm. you know? And so, of course, in the book, the baby appears right next to a group of Kashmiri mothers of the disappeared. I mean, there are about 10,000 disappeared people in Kashmir, but hmm. the mothers don't know what to do with the baby that has appeared. and. Uh, from this sort of space, uh, you can, you can, the nerves of the no novel move outwards. Yes, the two halves of the novel meet in that moment. Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. there's a Delhi half, the first half, and the second half is more of a Kashmir. Uh, will eventually end up in Kashmir, but they do meet at that moment, and that was a real moment that you lived. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, so in the first part of the book, we meet um, your first protagonist, uh, Anjum. And she is, we see her birth, uh, her mother holding her for the first time and making this incredible discovery that her gender is not quite settled. Um, she is uh, 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 Hijra, Hijra. Now, here in the United States, we are now beginning to be aware of transgendered as an identity. Um, and of course, all societies, all cultures have always produced transgendered people. But in India, this is something that goes back centuries, this identity of being hijra. Yes? Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 um, it's always had a place. Whether that place is a safe place or not can be disputed because, oh. it, it, yes. you know, actually, it's, it's, it's had an organization, they have an organizational structure. In Delhi, for example, there are various what are called gharanas, and the city is divided into zones, and each has a each group has a particular zone that it kind of can patrol and go to weddings and births and get money, and so there's a system. But uh, the language of uh, you know the precise language of rights and Western liberal in Western liberal society is now replacing a more of, uh, amorphous mm. uh, language, you know? So it does do things simultaneously. You know, on the one hand, uh, the Supreme Court, I mean, this is not about trans, but the Supreme Court of India has actually recently criminalized homosexuality. Oh. So it's moving backwards in some ways, you know? And 
on the issue of gender while there are while modern society is developing languages to address what maybe now is 57 genders, but still that leaves out the 58th or the 59th. You know, so are people being freed or are they being isolated? And was the earlier system uh, violent or was it accepting? I mean, in, this, in the book you can see the eras changing. Yes, uh, Anjum lives and, these different and, eras. Yeah, that, yes. and, and she lives, I mean, she is born in, to a Shia family in Old Delhi, and then she moves into a, ho into a household of hijras, who are not, I mean, who all belong to different genders, and uh, some, are, some have had surgery, some have not, some are, uh, some are Sunni, some are Shia, some are Christian, some are Hindu. And in fact, Anjum's story is interesting, because she actually gets caught up in the 2002 massacre yes. in Gujarat, not because she's a hijra, but because she's a Muslim. Mm -hmm. And then the person she's with is killed, and she escapes because she's a hijra, and there's the belief that, oh, to kill, kill her would bring the murderers bad luck. You know, so she lives the rest of her life, in a way, thinking of herself as butcher's luck, you know? Mm -hmm. But the thing is that she's not, uh, I mean, it's not a sociology. No, I mean, she's course. like one of the many characters who has the border of gender running through her. But each of the characters has a sort of incendiary border running through them in a society that, though from the outside people think of India as a very anarchic mm. kind of democracy where there's Bollywood and there's all this kind of stuff mm. going on, but actually it's a very, very tightly, uh, um, f it's a society because of the caste system and because there are more than 4,000 castes and very little intermarriage, so it actually lives in a very fine and very, in a mesh more than a grid, mm -hmm. where everybody is isolated and policed and even any form of intermarriage can still result in people being killed, people being lynched. Of course, every day you're hearing that in the papers now. Well, and she, there's this beautiful, with her, a coming of age story. She comes of age uh, into India as the country is changing, uh, there's all these movements, and she forms her own kind of family in this place that's on the edge of, or inside a cemetery. Can you tell us a little bit about the family of people that she builds around her and how different they are? And well, f uh, first of all, the interest, I mean, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of the book is set in graveyards. Yes. You know, the, the graveyard, Anjum, at one point, when she comes back from Gujarat after having been through what she's been through and somehow can't uh, even live with her old companions and she's distraught and she moves into an old graveyard on the edges of the wall, the medieval wall city, where she uh, lives uh, f ravaged by grief for a long time, just open, in the open between the drug addicts and the hospital waste because the graveyard is attached to a hospital. But gradually as she as she, she recovers from the horror, she builds, she starts building and closing the graves of her families and building a guest house called the Jannat guest house. Jannat means paradise in, in Urdu. Mm. And so you have a, a, a Jannat guest house built over a graveyard in Kashmir, and then, I mean in Delhi. And then you have Kashmir, which many people refer to as Jannat because it's so beautiful, mm -hmm. and that Jannat covered in graveyards, you know? And there is a, I mean, a, other than the border between people, between caste, between, uh, that I said runs through these characters, which we can come to, is also a sort of porous border between life and death, where the dead are sometimes more alive than the living. And Anjum says, I'm not, whenever the municipality comes to chase her out, she says, I'm not living here, I'm dying here. Mm. And, mm -hmm. and she gradually becomes a kind of hub for many people who have been driven out by the mm -hmm. big wheels turning. So one of her, 
one of her very close comrades and companions becomes a man who calls himself Saddam Hussein because he, he's actually a young Dalit, Dalit being the t a term used today for people who used to be called untouchables in the caste system. And he has, he lives in a, he comes from a village just outside Delhi and has watched his father being lynched by a mob of cow protectors, you know, mm -hmm. based on the fact that they were transporting a carcass of a cow, which is what, what his community does. And he, in, he, he converts from Hinduism and embraces Islam, and though he doesn't know much about Islam, but he just wants to convert. And uh, he calls himself Saddam Hussein because he has a video of Saddam Hussein's execution on his phone, and he's very impressed by Saddam's disdain for his executioners. So he, he, he just says, you know, I want to do what I have to do. Basically wants to uh, get revenge for that lynching, and then I want to die, die like him. Mm. So, but then Saddam and Anjum together begin to run the Janat guest house to which many other people come. You know, I, I um, knew you'd worked as a journalist, and the portrait of this place in Delhi and of, these, um, of this family is so rich. I just imagined you walking through these places, reporting and, you know, gathering detail. But I know you don't really, you don't work that way. You, you, this is more 20 years, uh, no, a lifetime of living in a city and absorbing what you, what you feel and what you see there. Yeah, well, I don't know... Uh, I, I think I myself am sort of indeterminate in terms of <laughs> my, you know, I wouldn't, I don't think, you know, the essays are necessarily journalistic mm. and sometimes they combine uh, sort of reportage and the skills of a fiction writer and academic, uh, you know, research, mm -hmm. for example, in, in a historic uh, in an essay, in a big essay that I wrote called The Doctor and the Saint, it's, it's academic work, you know, so it's all sort of uh, all over the place. But in, in terms of uh, this novel, no, I didn't really, I don't, uh, I don't think I could write researched fiction. It comes from somewhere else and I have uh, actually, I do, I do live and spend a long time in Old Delhi and walk through the streets at night and sit in the mosques and visit, I mean, mm. just wander like a vagrant through the city. So it just began to grow like a tide, you know, it's, it's, mm. it's, it's, it's not, certainly not that I decided that I'm going to write this kind of a book and let me go and figure it out. Right. It didn't yes, work yes. like that. Mm. Well, you know, I've seen you compared to so many different writers, and the one who I don't see as often, and who really, you really, uh, the themes of your book remind me a lot of Dickens, you know, and just this incredibly sweeping portrait of a time. You know, you, this to me feels like a, a, a cry uh, a, a, about the time that you're living through, the, what you've seen happen to India. And like Dickens wrote about the Industrial Revolution and these people who had been uh, whose lives had been turned upside down uh, by the Industrial Revolution. It seems to me that a lot of the book is concerned with that, with how these economic changes have wrought this conflict in, in India and changed the lives of all kinds of people. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I wanted to write about the air, you know, mm. uh, in the sense that I feel Sometimes, I, I suppose, after, if, if, you, if you write a book as I did, The God of Small Things, and suddenly become very famous, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a great danger of being domesticated, you know, yes. where then you're expected to write the son of the god of small things and <laughs> god of small things too right and, and i <laughs> the prequel uh, to the god yeah. yes <laughs> and i i was uh, and to me you know the the uh, i i think i wanted to explore having been through lived the life i have over the last 20 years i wanted 
I, I believe greatly in the novel as a form. Mm, yes. And I wanted to, to see what it could be, which nothing else could be. Not a book of history, not a book trying to be a film, but how do you, and, and it's, not just, it's not just I that ran the risk of being domesticated. I also think the speed at which books have to be bought and sold and presented and catalogued and given advances and put on bestseller lists and so on, it eventually, you, you end up like with sort of NGO funding headlines, you know? Like, mm -hmm. is it about gender? Is it about this? Is it about peace? Is it about war? Is it about urban? You know, and to me, it has to be about all this because that's the air we breathe. We breathe the air of music and poetry and intimacy and love and brutal occupation and caste and it's artificial to separate them. Yes. It's artificial to push politics out of fiction. It's not, it's not the other way around, you know? So um, the idea to me was really, how, how, can you, how can you look at a book really like, I was saying, like a city, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and it, it, you have, how, how can I write a book where I just don't walk past someone, even if it's a small character? Yes. And, and, and I, I know that that makes it challenging, that makes it complicated, but I do trust readers, that readers don't want just baby food, you know, mm -hmm. just some kind of pre-digested pap, right? And, Yes, there are lots of languages in the book because mm -hmm. someone who lives in Delhi, every day we speak a lot of languages. We speak Hindi, we speak Urdu. If you go to Jantar Mantar, you'll, you'll hear Telugu, you'll hear Malayalam, you know? And mm -hmm. how do you absorb these cadences into a novel without it becoming gimmicky or you're mm -hmm. not tricksy stuff, you know? And um, I, I, I thought, it's fine, you know, we have, uh, the world now is a place where, you know, people sitting in old Delhi have spent lifetimes reading Jane Austen or Tolstoy mm -hmm. or Joyce, so it's okay. We can mm -hmm. also be difficult and complicated and specific about our experiences. So, yeah, I, 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 uh, I thought I'd roll the dice. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you have um, <laughs> these love stories all throughout the book. Uh, love, a mother's love for a child, uh, old lovers who carry a torch for each other for decades, um, uh, and they, uh, they come together. Um, An Anjum has this love. She wants to be a, a mother. She has this desire for motherhood. Um, and I was wondering, uh, is that that call to motherhood, do you ever call upon your own mother in, not in a character specifically, but do you feel her spirit in your books? And how, how does she manifest herself in My in mother books? is a yeah. non-mother. <laughs> she, I don't think she, uh, but the thing is in, in, in the book, there are, there are so many women with so many different attitudes towards motherhood, yes. all of which are generous. You know, like the uh, Anjum, Anjum finds a, um, the first child she finds abandoned on the steps of the Jama Masjid and she brings yes. Jama Masjid, the big mosque in Old Delhi, and she brings her home and adopts her basically and calls her Zainab and, and, and really discovers what it means to, to love someone so completely. And then with as much longing as she joined the community of Hijras who lived in the mm -hmm. Khwabga, which is the house of dreams. She wants to leave and live a normal life and be a mother to Zainab. And then, of course, uh, you know, the Gujarat massacre and all that comes in the way of that. And then uh, there's Tilotma, who's the other main character in the book, who's, mm -hmm. uh, who's um, not really at all interested in, in motherhood or being a mother. You know, so there's a question, I mean, she, she could be one, but she doesn't want to be one. Yes. And so there are women with different attitudes towards it, which are not bitter or nasty or anything like that, but just, you know, the idea that 
everyone isn't the same. Everyone doesn't have the same kind of predilection, you know. And um, Tilo is, in, in a way, she's as strong as Arunjum is, but in a very different way. Tilo, in, you're saying. Tilo Tama, yes, yeah. Tilo, yes. She's a very, uh, she, she's a character who the, in the book says she's, she's like a, she lives in the country of her own skin mm. and a country that issues no visas, you know. <laughs> so she's very confounding to people and she's uh, strange um, in, a, in, a, in a way that's almost walking the border of uh, what, what her husband at one point wonders whether it's, uh, whether it's actually insanity or a perilous kind of sanity. And, uh, you know, Anjum has the generosity and she hosts all the people that, that come and live in the guest house, including Tilo at the end. But Tilo Thuma is, is, is uh, she's a wild poet in a way, you know, who walks alone. Well, she went to architecture school, yes, like you did. But yes. she's not. I've, I've read in other interviews that you, you say she's not modeled on you, but you she, have some things in common. She's, um, she is, um, to me, in my head, I mean, it, didn't yes. ma it doesn't matter, but in my head, she was like, if um, Amu and Velita in The God of Small Things had a daughter and had their story <laughs> ended differently, their daughter would be Tilo, you know? So okay. she would be the younger sibling of Estepan and Ryan the strange younger sibling. So I know her well, but mm. I'm not her. Okay. <laughs> so, so Tilo is in the university, and she meets other people around a play that someone is putting on at the university. And, um, and they come, can you tell me a little bit about who those people are? Uh, uh, Nage and Garson Hobart and Musa. Tell us a little bit about that cohort of people and how they come together because they're going to be the second half of the, the novel. Mus uh, Tilo, Tilo and Musa, who I just read about, Musa, mm -hmm. who's a Kashmiri, meet in the School of Architecture and, uh, and are together for, for a while. And then they're not, and they sort of drift apart. And he goes back to Kashmir and gets involved in the politics there. And she. Um, you know, works in an architecture firm and lives in the straight little in a little storeroom on the edge of the darga, the shrine of Hazrat Nizamuddin, on her own. And she um, she sort of doesn't deny rumors that she's working for a drug uh, <laughs> gang yes. because she feels that it gives her some kind of protection. <laughs> and, and, and the other two, Gar Garson Hobart, the man who's called Garson Hobart, who's one of the characters that I found um, when he started to visit me, uh, very, very interesting, because he's mm. a, a, a kind of bureaucrat. He ends up uh, working, he's a very sophisticated, upper caste, Mm, very oh. intelligent man who works in the intelligence bureau. A Brahmin almost. Or, a Brahmin. Yes, no, yes, not Brahmin. almost, a Brahmin. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, you know, he's, he, he has a, he, he too has a border running through him because one half of him is the kind of the voice of the Nehruvian state, not the current mm. rabid Hindu national state, yes. but the Nehruvian state that has created the climate for the rabid people to take over. So, you know, mm. sort of secular <laughs> and <laughs> uh, sort of uh, taking the long view of, you know, the massacres and the murders and the caste and the, you know, he, he, he has what in Hindi the word would be terav, you know, that ability to wait that the state has. Wow. The ability to look at something and then put it in a historical perspective and not take it personally. The ability to be cold in his views and intelligent. And on the other, the other hand, he's a slightly increasingly drunken, thwarted lover who, who um, is very self-deprecating 
is really clear about his own faults. He's not mm -hmm. selling himself in any way, you know? So mm -hmm. he's that. And the other man is Naga, mm -hmm. who's, who, who's uh, a, a very bright, very performative, very strutting guy, you know, who's, who sort of starts off as a radical, um, goes, uh, you know, as a student into the forests, uh, visiting indigenous, uh, you know, indigenous people's villages, comes back and performs uh, on stage, wearing a loincloth and eating termites on toast and playing the Rolling Stones and yes. just, you know, a great performer, but sort of, sort of empty, you know, uh, uh, just so uh, engrossed with himself. And then he, he moves quite rapidly, as such people do, from the left to the right, and the only thing that remains mm. unchanged, as Garson Hobart notes dryly, is the decibel level, mm. you know? And, wow. he's, and then he becomes a journalist, but then gradually gets, I mean, commits a few errors, and then gradually gets sort of taken over by the intelligence bureau and then starts to, starts to be their man in the media. And uh, yeah, so he's one of the other pretty fascinating people. So th these, um, th these friends come together in an India um, from 20 years ago, 25, 30 years ago, and in the meantime, there is this rise of Hindu nationalism. Um, now, I am a neophyte when it comes to India, and you mentioned many politicians. Um, how close are the descriptions of those politicians to actual politicians? See, I'm afraid I can't tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> it's too, too dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Too dangerous. Okay. I, um, I, I, I have... Well, I, I, know, have you know, uh, I just wanted to say yes. that I have... Uh, Every, every few years in my life, five male lawyers get together and file a criminal case against me. <laughs> so, so that's why I can't tell you. So first, first when I wrote The God of Small Things, five men, five lawyers filed a criminal case against me for corrupting public morality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> and when they, when they filed it, um, they filed it, and uh, by the time it, the, court, the case came up for hearing, I'd won the Booker Prize. They wanted to own the book, but the prize, but not the book. So the judge came out and said, uh, you know, every time this case comes before me, I get chest pains. <laughs> then the next few years later, five men, five male lawyers filed a case against me for trying to kill them outside the gates of the Supreme Court at a protest that I wasn't present at. But uh, for that, I, I mean, I was actually sent to jail for a day. And wow. then now uh, five men have filed another case against me, and on, I get home on Sunday, and the hearing is on Monday for uh, contempt of court. So, you know, we can't really talk about who these politicians are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you do have, in real life, there is a Prime Minister, Modi, who does... Really? He, he has Twitter, <laughs> yes? <laughs> I hear he's big on Twitter. Huh? Except that, unlike our president, he doesn't... Does he tweet disparaging remarks about women on his Twitter feed? <laughs> no, um, there's, you know, there's a huge difference between your man and ours. <laughs> <laughs> And the, to put it succinctly, the difference is that uh, yours is an outlier who's mm -hmm. just come in, you know, and uh, I think the deep state is very worried about him. Yes. Whereas ours is the deep state, <laughs> you know? So <laughs> the, the organization that he belongs to called the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh was set up in 1925, is very openly open about its belief that India should be declared a Hindu nation. Yes. That has been influenced by Mussolini's black shirts that keeps 
suggesting uh, that the constitution of India be changed from being called a social, socialist secular republic to a Hindu nation. And uh, so we are, we are looking at, at absolutely horrifying politics, but that's seeping up from, from the bottom to the top. The RSS has hundreds of thousands of volunteers, has uh, history is being rewritten, institutions are being infiltrated by them. Uh, and I can't decide whether the greater danger is Hindu nationalism or just sheer outright cretinism. You yes. Know? But it's a toss up. Wow. <laughs> well, there was a phrase that to me was very haunting as an American reader, uh, where you ask, uh, halfway through the book, one of the characters asks, will the center hold? And that character is optimistic that the center will hold. That's Garson, Garson Gars Hobart. Yes. I, I, I can read you that paragraph because it's yes. interesting. It's on, on my book, find... it's on page 155, yes. Oh, 155. As long as the center, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. You should read it. <laughs> And let, you know, sometimes the pages... Yeah, just... he's, this is Garson Hobart, who's talking about how when he was an, a university student, he actually witnesses on the street the massacre of Sikhs that took place in 80, 1984 in Delhi. Mm -hmm. And he watches uh, an old man being burnt to death by the mob. And he says that... Uh, so this is his ability, you know, to watch. And he says, they pulled off his turban and tore out his beard and necklaced him South Africa style. I hurried home and waited for the shock of what I had witnessed to hit me. Oddly, it never did. The only shock I felt was shock at my own equanimity. Hmm. I was disgusted by the stupidity and futility of it all, but I wasn't shocked. It could be that my familiarity with the gory history of the city I had grown up in had something to do with it. It was as though the apparition whose presence we in India are all constantly and acutely aware of had suddenly surfaced, snarling from the deep, and behaved exactly as we expected it to. Once its appetite was sated, it sank back into its subterranean lair and normality closed over it. Normality in our part of the world is a bit like a boiled egg. Its humdrum surface conceals at its heart a yoke of egregious violence. It is our constant anxiety about that violence, our memory of its past labors and our dread of its future manifestations that lays down the rules for how people as complex and as diverse as we are continue to coexist continue to live together, tolerate each other, and from time to time, murder one another. Mm. As long as the center holds, as long as the yoke doesn't run, we'll be fine. In moments of crisis, it helps to take the long view. Mm. So this is the voice of the state. Mm. Um, but uh, he finds himself, Garson Hobart, finds himself not drawn to, but he goes to Kashmir, he becomes drawn into the war. And so my question for you is, how did you become drawn to Kashmir? How did you begin to travel there to learn about what was happening there and to immerse yourself in it so much that you would end up writing a novel about it? How did that begin for you? Well, look, you know, the thing is that in India, we are actually fed Kashmir. Oh. We are supposed to applaud the atrocities that go on there, mm. you know? It's the densest military occupation in the world. And uh, I mean, I have, my closest friends actually are Kashmiri, and so w when I started going there, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't that I'd started going there because I wanted to write a book, mm -hmm. but you, when you arrive there, you just feel astonished at the falsehood that is fed to mm. the rest of the country, you know? And, and to me, the question was, how do you, uh, how are you supposed to hold that kind of, um, that kind of immorality in, 
inside you and then not uh, i mean with what with, with what face do you then protest other injustices mm -hmm. if you're prepared to digest that so i uh, i and and when i started you know when I, when i began to understand the extent of what was happening there i realized the power of fiction you know mm -hmm. that you can't really write about that kind of thing just with human rights reports and the documentation of the dead yes. and the disappeared because what does 25 living what does uh, an occupation like that do to people not just to the kashmiris but also to the indians also to the soldiers also to the collaborator it's such a complicated um poisonous and terrifying thing and you you know you you can't write about it with footnotes and evidence and reportage you have to write about it uh, only in a novel you know can you mm -hmm. look at it from all angles yeah because it's a it's not just a political event it's an event that is inserting itself into the psyche of so many people and it's placing them in all these incredible moral quandaries yes. and creating all of these incredibly surreal situations that you describe uh, in interrogations or families that are divided or, or you know, people's motives being questioned. You let the soldiers into your home. Well, I had to, they were sold, you know. But so there's just so much, it's so rich and so frightening at the same time. Yeah, yeah I mean, and, and as, as I said, it's not, you know, it's not just the story of uh, oppressors and the oppressed. Yes. It's not like that, you know, so it's really about, uh, and I think it, 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 does, it does connect to what is happening in other parts of the world, and it's, it's really, in some ways, a moral question, you know, of uh, is this acceptable? Is this something that should be celebrated and considered acceptable? And what is the meaning of a nation state? Mm -hmm. And does the integrity of that supersede every kind of horror? You know? How would you explain briefly to uh, an American audience what exactly is happening in Kashmir and all? I mean, I know this is, uh, you <laughs> wrote a, a whole novel about it, but you know, just it's is it it's it's an okay, issue, issue I, I of mean, national I, identity I wanna, and religion. I, yeah, I don't want yes. to get. Um, I mean, I don't want to sort of only yes. talk about that. Simplifies. But let me just yeah. try and say something very simply that at the time of independence, uh, this subcontinent mm -hmm. was not what we imagined. That there was a country, the British colonized it, and then they left. It wasn't like that. The, it was the British actually who marked out the borders mm. in 1899 of what the mm. nation of India and Pakistan and Bangladesh were. Yes. And then when um, independence came in 1947, there were more than 500 princely kingdoms within those, mm. within that boundary. Uh, and each of them was asked to choose whether they want to go to India or Pakistan. And Kashmir was what is known as the, it was one of the princely kingdoms, it was an un, it's what's called the unfinished business of, Pakis, uh, mm. of partition, you know? And so it was a Muslim-dominated state with a Hindu king and uh, who had already been challenged by the people. Mm. So it's a, it's, a, it's a complicated, and yet I don't think it's necessarily only to be decided upon because of what it was in history, you know? Because yes. hi we make history, and we make morals. Well, I th yes. <laughs> and it, it's just a, a absolutely painful thing to read about such a beautiful place transformed into a place of, of mm. modern day horrors, of, yeah. of torture and- No, the and I mean, let's, let's not forget that British colonialism has marked out these borders and uh, just cutting through things and like as if they're just you know carving up a leg of lamb or something they've done it all over the world hmm. well i'm going to ask one more question before we open it up to question and answer there'll be microphones here for people who want to ask questions 
And I guess um, the, I, I wanted to ask what you wanted people to take away from this book. And I can tell you what I took away from it was just being enlightened and outraged and concerned and connected and understanding that my humanity had this connection to these to people in another country who've lived a very different history, but it, not entirely that different from my history as a Guatemalan. And I'm just wondering what, what you want, what we, sort of your hope is that people will take from reading this novel. I don't, uh, I don't think like that, mm. you know? I mean, I, I, I just think mm-hmm. um, when, I, when I write, it's like trying to construct a universe and it's almost like a love letter, you know? and people should take whatever they want from it, you know? And I think uh, what amazes me, really, is that I, I'm a person who has never lived outside of India, I mean, mm. not even studied outside India or anything. And I sit there and I'm, whether it was The God of Small Things or whether it's any of the political essays or this book, it's so specific and uh, yet, obviously, you know, the more specific you are, the more it seems to resonate with people uh, mm. because you don't yes. want anything formulaic, you know, and yet, ultimately, the deeper you burrow, you come out with, with, with the human condition. And, all, uh, and I think that's what literature does, you know, it, it's the opposite of national boundaries and mm. nuclear weapons, it just vaults over all that. And people, uh, it's, it's the, mm-hmm. I think it's the fundamental thing about human beings, our ability to tell each other stories. It's a very primal thing to tell each other stories. So I don't have any prescription or anything mm-hmm. that I would any particular way in which I want the book to be read. It's not mine anymore, it's yours, you know. Wow. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> and there are so many wonderful stories. And do we have now our uh, ready for questions here? We have two microphones set up here and there. What an honor. Oh my gosh, I can't <laughs> believe we're in the same room. <laughs> Your books, your two novels, have been utterly overwhelming. Um, The intensity, the layers, I don't know where to begin. But um, the boldness is, I think, as people from India, of Indian descent, can really appreciate your references to the obscure, all, all the things that make India, India. And you didn't spare us any details. Til the black sesame seed, and um, the one, the Tiffin um, artist, amazing. So I'm being told to ask the question. (laughs) (laughs) The morality that's been corrupted in India is certainly, I think, central in Bollywood. And um, my question for you is, other than Shabana Azmi, sitting here, we've never seen a voice of morality come from Bollywood. And the Fortune 500 just named a few of those fellows with the last name Khan as the richest entertainers in the world. Do they have any responsibility Mm. to speak up morally, in your opinion? Thank you. See, the thing is that, uh, first of all, you know, I'm a little bit uncomfortable about preaching responsibility to anybody. I mean, you know, they have to make their decisions, but I think what, what happens now, what is happening now in India is that people, especially you know, actors, they are part of an industry, and that industry is extremely vulnerable. Mm. So every time anyone half says something, they get boycotted, the you know, cinema halls get threatened, and so on. So it's a, I mean, it's a terrible situation, and I, um, I mean, I wish that everybody would, would show courage. And some people have, I mean, there are people like uh, Mahesh Bhatt and you know, others who do say things, but the, the, the situation is, is, is truly terrifying now in India. You know? Forget the big people. You know, mm-hmm. The idea that you have 
factory, like you have factory grown trolls now. You have mm. tens of thousand people on WhatsApp groups that deliberately spread rumors and then people are lynched, people are killed. And each person that's lynched in the presence of policemen mm. are, uh, you know, the whole community is under threat. The whole community is terrified. Mm. I mean, when I spoke in New York on this trip, in the audience was the daughter of a former member of the Legislative Assembly called Ehsan Jafri, who was hacked to death by mm. a mob in the Gujarat massacre. He, you know, 60 people or something were sheltering mm. in his house. I don't remember the figure, but all of them were killed. He was killed, the women were killed. And, uh, you know, court cases go on for years, nothing happens. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's it, it, you know, really a very, very dangerous situation. And the reason that ne not much news comes out is because it's a market-friendly democracy. <laughs> so it has to be seen as a finance destination and so on. But ultimately, I would say, even for those who believe Mm. in that the situation is going way out of control. Mm. Our next question over here, yes. Thank you, I wanna thank you for your courage of your voice and your activism and all that you do. Um, you've used some historical names for some of your characters like Saddam Hussein. You also use the name Jahanara Begum, who happens to be one of my favorite women in history who is the daughter of Shah Jahan and Mumtaz Mahal. And I was just curious if you could speak to that. Um, well, it's, it's I, I mean, I didn't really use it for that reason. You know, it's, it's not an uncommon name. No. Yeah. <laughs> well. <laughs> yeah. But, <Okay>. but yeah. <laughs> Because she was also a Sufi mystic and and poet and so forth, and because one of the yeah. early scenes, so I but guess I was carrying. Yeah, my but own it is. I mean, it is like when you read the, you know, uh, what she feels when when her son, who then becomes Anjum, is born. She, you know, it says that finally she rested. Her seventh reaction was to rest, like the God of the Christians did after he had made heaven and earth. But she rested after what she had created, scrambled her sense of the world she knew, you mm. know? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, over As, here? And Jahan a, means world. <laughs> no. Yes. Qu next question over here. Yes. Hello. Hello. Um, uh, you have been a hero for the since the first minute I uh, read your book 20 years ago in Karachi, and you're as magical and luminous as I imagined you would be. Thank you. Thank oh. you. I think we all agree. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and my question for you is, uh, you have this playful way of talking about your characters. You love them. You have like this relationship with them, which I think um, goes beyond what I have with my kids. I try to emulate. <laughs> 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 but they talk back, I think, way more than your characters. But um, how do you balance that playfulness with this uh, very clear-eyed view of this world that is very, very dark? Mm. And I think we all share this. I think we're all going through this right now, in this country at least, and in the world. Of There's just so much that is pulling us into that, to think that the world is horrible, and we've, we're missing our playfulness. We're somehow mm. Losing it, and you've been doing this for years, so I, I figure you might have something to say. <laughs> well, um, you know, I think, I think it's um, it's in itself an act of resistance to insist on having that. You know, to insist uh, to insist on not. Um, uh, I mean, I, I, I learned that when I was a young woman living in Delhi on my own, that somehow that, that they wanted you to hunch your shoulders and be scared of them and, you know, and, and it just enraged me, mm. the idea that 
I was not supposed to walk in a certain way or laugh in a certain way or look a certain way or dress in a certain way. Not, I, I mean, it was just, uh, and, and I didn't, I, uh, you know, what I, meant, I mean is not that I wanted to, um, it's just you want that freedom, right? And you have to keep demanding it. It's absolutely uh, necessary. And when I have been inside the forest with the Maoist guerrillas fighting the most, you know, the most violent battle, the poorest people in the world standing up to the most violent activity, you know, they're trying to clear the forests for the mining companies or whether it's the anti-dam movement against displacement, you, you always see the joy there too, you know, and I, I could never miss it and I would never forgive myself if I just had this very uh, militant, single note story, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's very, very important, I think, for us to insist on our entire bandwidth, you know? <laughs> yeah. Thank you for speaking. Um, I wanted to say, uh, when you were reading your passage about Musa in Kashmir, it really evoked a lot of emotion in me. Um, my dada, my grandfather, and I'm sure a lot of people in this room have connections to Kashmir, but he was from Kashmir and then had to flee during partition and then became a refugee in Pakistan and then was never able to return. And so we would hear these stories growing up, and I think my dad did too, about how beautiful Kashmir is, and you know how you described it, like Jannat described in the same way. And my dad has not been able to go to Sirinagar, nor did my dada ever go back. Um, and then I, we haven't gone back. Um, and I guess my question to you is for people who are far away from their homelands, um, well, my, my first comment is to say thank you for being able to draw that connection out for someone who's living in California and whose family is from far away. You have really been able to, I think, with your words and your speech, draw out an emotional connection that you don't see in your day to day. And I guess my question is more about like activism, because I'm not a writer, but I'm a reader. Um, and so what, like, I know you don't want to be prescriptive, but what is something you think we could do, you know, as a Pakistani American mm. to alleviate in any way the situation in Kashmir? Or mm. is that too big of a task to even, you know, ask a question about? Wow. It's too big. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are, there are so many people who've been working in so many ways, you know, and I'm sure you can, you can get in touch with them and uh, see what, what, what more can happen from here. I mean, I, I don't even, you know, I don't live here, I don't know what's going on here. And um, I, all I know is that I, I do think that everybody should should start to think about the fact that this is a conflict that involves two nuclear powers, you know? So mm. it's the business of the whole world. You yes. Know? <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I have a question over here. And, and I mean, this morality about mm. what is happening in Kashmir, what is happening in, ba in Bangladesh, what is happening in Balochistan, meaning we, we, we can all be, be very moral about one thing and then just be blind to the other thing, you know? So I think we do need to look at things through, through a prism of, of justice mm. and a political morality. Yes, yes. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm a member of a transnational feminist organization and um, a lot of us read uh, tons of theory and tons of like political essays, um, and but we find that fiction, especially in dark times, um, mm. does allow us to to dream, right? Mm. And uh, and you mentioned storytelling, so I'm wondering like, what do you think? Um, 
can storytelling do in the struggle to achieve like genuine liberation mm. for us all as, as mm. people? I think that um, you know it's a it's an amorphous thing, you know, mm. but but I I think that unless you I mean uh, this 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 uh, the idea of fiction, which comes from a place of memory, imagination, reality, dream, perception. You know, so so uh, you you have to you, you know a person who asked me a question earlier about how real these characters are for me. It's true that they are more real than real people for me, mm -hmm. you know? And to put women like Anjum or Tilo into the world is so important because, uh, mm. you know, historically women need to see people who practice their freedom. Hmm. and can practice their freedom. Not just women, I'm just giving that as an example. But um, so, so I think there is the, the possibility of, of a kind of liberation, you know? One of my friends, uh, I mean, one of the most beautiful things mm, uh, that was said to me about the Ministry of Utmost Happiness before it was published, actually. I, was, I, I showed the manuscript to a friend of mine from Kashmir, and he read it, and he said, I feel as though we've got freedom, mm. you know? Wow. So uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's like you have to dream it first before anything. Yeah. Well, I think we'll take two more questions, and then we'll go to the last reading. So over okay. here for a last question from this side, and apologies to everyone who didn't get a chance to ask a question. Yes, hi. Uh, First of all, I would, first of all, I want to. I'm so happy and excited to see you. I can't <laughs> control my emotions because I love you very much. Oh, thank uh. you very much. And uh, my question to you is: uh, When did you decide to support uh, Dalits and Kashmiris? As you know, that there is a majority of Hindus. And uh, recently, they said uh, we will kick out the Garandati Roy, the some political leaders because she's international, and you're not scared of those things that they might not give you the citizenship or they, they'll throw you out from the... Actually, I'm a Kashmiri, and I am <laughs> being through all those stories. Mm. And I had seen that real life mm. of many women. There were uh, 50 women raped once. I was six years old, and I had seen those women coming hospital with the blood. I am from next to that village that if you heard about Kunan Poshpura, Poshpura. Yes. yes, there were 50 women. I was six years old. And mm. I remember all those stories, all those crying, all those shoutings. And when you write and you are not scared of those when you go back to the India and you don't think that they are going to harass you or do something with you. Mm. Well, you know, the thing is that it would be silly not to be scared, you know? Uh, and it's not that I'm... Uh, it's not that I'm entirely fearless, but I see, uh, I see that so many people have to live in that situation in Kashmir and now increasingly in India. So, um, you know, what do you do? You have to do what you have to do, isn't it? Mm -hmm. like Actually, you I am, I'm even scared to go sometimes when I go to India. I'm like scared to tell last, last year I was yeah. like, if I stay in Delhi, I don't want to tell my name as like I'm Kashmiri or something. I was scared to meet my yeah. close best friends yeah. because I was feeling because I was writing on the Facebook something and I was scared if they do something with me and I don't feel comfortable because they are like, they actually they think that they love their own country but that's not called love. Mm. Okay. And they don't accept other people's rights. Yeah, but it's, uh, I mean, I think you're referring to the fact that recently um, meaning about a month ago, the army tied a Kashmiri civilian to mm -hmm. a, 
armored vehicle and used him as a human shield, dri driving him around for four or five hours, which is, which is by the way, uh, not the worst thing that the army has done there. Mm. Uh, but uh, he was, the officer was honored uh, for having done that. And uh, then a week later or something, mm. uh, a member of parliament who also happens to be a Bollywood star <laughs> said that uh, instead of him, Arundhati Roy should be used as a human shield. And so, you know, it created a lot of uh, uh, debate where, of course, the TV channels were uh, holding programs like, was he right in suggesting that she should be used? <laughs> but, you know, I mean, now the media, uh, much of the media, oh, everything is, everything, just to watch these institutions crumble is, mm. is frightening. However, yesterday, uh, you know, thousands of people came out and marched on the streets of Delhi, you know, showing courage. And I think, I, I still believe that there are people who, who have an incredible sense of justice. And for the first time ever, I think, students in universities, uh, all over India are beginning to really question what is happening in Kashmir mm -hmm. and the occupation of Kashmir. And w much of the brutality against students or, or, or these kinds of comments about someone like me is because of that fear that, that uh, the word is getting out. You mm -hmm. know? Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for you. applying my questions. And now our, our last question before the before the reading, last reading. Hi. Um, first off, I want to say I'm a little nervous, so I'm hoping I can be eloquent. Mm -hmm. I started to read your books, actually, mostly your essays through political things, and then I went to your books, and I was um, mm -hmm. really moved by how much it drew me back into a world that encompassed a lot of what was happening in me as well as out in the world. One thing that I noticed with you talking tonight you brought up borders a lot, and you brought up borders of the culture and borders of the environment, but also borders of the character and, um, and society and borders of language. And I was wondering if that was something you thought about or if that... Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think that, you know, like I said, because India is a society that is so regimented by caste, yeah including Muslim society, including Christian society in India. Once you come into contact with caste, it seems to just take over. And um, I actually grew up in the village that the God of Small Things is set in. Mm. And my mother, who comes from a community called the Syrian Christians, who only a very tiny community in Kerala, married outside, was divorced when, she, she, you know, when I was just too. And so I belong to a very tiny proportion, a percentile of Indians who actually I'm not part of the grid. And mm. if you're not part of the grid, the grid becomes something that you keep looking at and wondering about, you know. And so, uh, I, and, and it's not just about caste and things. You, even if you, uh, you know, even when you're involved with all these resistance movements, you find that people who are, say, politically radical will be socially conservative. People who are socially conserv uh, radical will be politically conservative. And all these borders seem to run through me. Mm. I have to call myself the edge girl. <laughs> you know? so, so you keep, you know, I suppose I just have an antenna out for, for, <laughs> for it. It's just the way I am. Yeah, that makes sense. I Thank really you. appreciated the use of that word. It Thank you. Struck something. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. Well, Thank, Thank you. you all for your questions. <laughs> and now, yeah. Arundhati, you'll have your last reading here. Yes. Okay. Now Which I'm is from the beginning of the book. From the beginning of the book. Well, the book is dedicated to the unconsoled. Mm. At magic hour, when the sun has gone, but the light has not, 
Armies of flying foxes unhinge themselves from the banyan trees in the old graveyard and drift across the city like smoke. When the bats leave, the crows come home. Not all the din of their homecoming fills the silence left by the sparrows that have gone missing and the old white-backed vultures, custodians of the dead for more than a hundred million years that have been wiped out. The vultures died of diclofenac poisoning. Diclofenac, cow aspirin, given to cattle as a muscle relaxant to ease pain and increase the production of milk, works, worked like nerve gas on white-backed vultures. Each chemically relaxed milk-producing cow or buffalo that died became poisoned vulture bait. As cattle turned into better dairy machines, as the city ate more ice cream, butterscotch crunch, nutty buddy, and chocolate chip, as it drank more mango milkshake, vultures' necks began to droop as though they were tired and simply couldn't stay awake. Silver beards of saliva dripped from their beaks, and one by one they tumbled off their branches, dead. Not many noticed the passing of the friendly old birds. There was so much else to look forward to. So the first chapter is called, Where Do Old Birds Go to Die? Mm. She lived in the graveyard like a tree. At dawn, she saw the crows off and welcomed the bats home. At dusk, she did the opposite. Between shifts, she conferred with the ghosts of vultures that loomed in her high branches. She felt the gentle grip of their talons like an ache in an amputated limb. She gathered they weren't altogether unhappy at having excused themselves and exited from the story. When she first moved in, she endured months of casual cruelty like a tree would, without flinching. She didn't turn to see which small boy had thrown a stone at her, didn't crane her neck to read the insults scratched into her bark. When people called her names, clown without a circus, queen without a palace, she let the hurt blow through her branches like a breeze and used the music of her rustling leaves as balm to ease the pain. It was only after Ziauddin, the blind imam who had once led the prayers in Fatehpuri Masjid, befriended her and began to visit her that the neighborhood decided it was time to leave her in peace. Long ago, a man who knew English told her that her name written backwards in English spelt Majnu. In the English version of the story of Layla and Majnu, he said, Majnu was called Romeo and Layla was Juliet. She found that hilarious. You mean I've made a khichdi of their story, she asked. What will they do when they find that Layla may actually be Majnu and Romy was really Julie? <laughs> the next time he saw her, the man who knew English said he'd made a mistake. <laughs> her name spelled backwards would be Mujna, which wasn't a name and meant nothing at all. <laughs> <laughs> To this she said, it doesn't matter, I'm all of them. I'm Romy and Julie, I'm Leila and Majnu and Mujna. Why not? Who says my name is Anjum? I'm not Anjum, I'm Anjuman. I'm a mehfil, I'm a gathering of everybody and nobody, of everything and nothing. Is there anyone else you'd like to invite? Everyone's invited. The man who knew English said it was clever of her to come up with that one. He said he'd never have thought of it himself. She said, how could you have with your standard of Urdu? What do you think, English makes you clever automatically? <laughs> he laughed, she laughed at his laugh. They shared a filter cigarette. He complained that Will's navy cut cigarettes were short and stumpy and simply not worth the price. She said she preferred them any day to four square or the very manly red and white. She didn't remember his name now. Perhaps she never knew it. He was long gone, the man who knew English, to wherever he had to go. And she was living in the graveyard behind the government hospital. 
For company, she had her steel Godridge Almira in which she kept her music, scratched records and tapes, an old harmonium, her clothes, jewelry, her father's poetry books, her photo albums, and a few press clippings that had survived the fire at the Khwabga. She hung the key around her neck on a black thread, along with her bent silver toothpick. She slept on a threadbare Persian carpet that she locked up in the day and unrolled between two graves at night. As a private joke, never the same two on consecutive nights. She still smoked, still navy cut. One morning while she read the newspaper aloud to him, the old imam who clearly hadn't been listening asked, affecting a casual air, is it true that even the Hindus among you are buried, not cremated? Sensing trouble, she prevaricated. True? Is what true? What is truth? Unwilling to be deflected from his line of inquiry, the imam muttered a mechanical response. Such khuda hai, khuda hi such hai. Truth is God, God is truth. The sort of wisdom that was available on the backs of the painted trucks that r roared down the highways. <laughs> then he narrowed his blind green eyes and asked in a sly green whisper, tell me, you people, when you die, where do they bury you? Who bathes the bodies? Who says the prayers? Anjum said nothing for a long time. Then she leaned across and whispered back, untree-like, Imam Sahib, when people speak of color, red, blue, orange, when they describe the sky at sunset or moonrise during Ramzan, what goes through your mind? Having wounded each other thus, deeply, almost mortally, the two sat quietly side by side on someone's sunny grave, hemorrhaging. Eventually, it was Anjum who broke the silence. You tell me, she said, you're the Imam Saab, not me. Where do old birds go to die? Do they fall on us like stones from the sky? Do we stumble on their bodies in the streets? Do you not think that the all-seeing, almighty one who put us on this earth has made proper arrangements to take us away? That day, the Imam's visit ended earlier than usual. Anjum watched him leave, tap, tap, tapping his way through the graves, his seeing eye cane making music as it encountered the empty booze bottles and discarded syringes that littered his path. She didn't stop him. She knew he'd be back. No matter how elaborate its charade, she recognized loneliness when she saw it. She sensed that in some strange, tangential way, he needed her shade as much as she needed his. And she had learned from experience that need was a warehouse that could accommodate a considerable amount of cruelty. Even though Anjum's departure from the Khwabga had been far from cordial, she knew that his dreams and its secrets were not hers alone to betray. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.